Ultimately, ultimately, the goal is to create a healthy and prosperous region and a community that can move forward in the years to come and be resilient against climate impacts. So how do we do this? Primarily, Growing Climate Solutions does three things. We do education, like the presentation we're receiving today. We do individual presentations for HOAs. We also have an evening series called the Southwest Compass Series. We do projects with our partners. They can include things like tree plantings or working with the Resilience Compact or other initiatives that our partners need help with. So we're here as a sort of expertise um, to support them. And we do communications through our newsletter, our educational flyer that highlights what other organizations are also doing in terms of environmental awareness and education and we have a pretty active social media account. So today's why and how workshops, a little bit about them. This is something that emerged from our stakeholders. We asked people what they wanted and what they wanted were, you know, short sound bites, you know, short presentations that at the end they walked out with really actionable ideas. They were very topic specific, so we're not going to wax and wane on, you know, the causes of climate change and all kinds of things. They're kind of topic specific. And what we're looking for are local experts that can provide really good local solutions. So that's the, the focus of the why and how workshops. We also have this evening series called the Southwest Florida Climate Compass. I'm going to make a quick plug because the last one of the 2022 series is next week, a week from today at four o'clock. And we're having a very special speaker from Ford Motor Company, um, Ms. Cynthia Williams. So if you like this presentation, this one is a more national speaker, so I hope you'll join us for that. And before we get started about on today's presentation, I want you to just remind yourselves that this is a Zoom workshop being done in the meeting format. Because it's a meeting and not a webinar, everybody's mic is on and everybody's camera is on. So please stay muted during our presenter's presentation. Um, avoid doing things you don't want others to see on the camera because everyone can see you. Um, if you have to turn off your camera to avoid distractions. We do want to encourage dialogue. Um, it is a workshop. So once our presenter is finishes speaking, we like to dedicate the other half an hour, hopefully to an active dialogue with questions and answers. And finally, at the end of this, you will receive a survey from Growing Climate Solutions via our constant contact account. Please take five minutes to fill out this five question survey. It really helps us organize our thoughts about how to organize the future why and how workshops. And without further ado, I want to present our amazing speaker today, Dr. Catherine Toms. Um, she is representing Florida Clinicians for Climate Action today because that's one of our partners. And Dr. Toms is a public health physician specializing in maternal and child health. She was born in Miami, but raised in the outskirts of Asheville, North Carolina. Dr. Toms has practiced medicine all over, including Norway, before she returned to the US. She lived in Alabama for a period of time with her family and currently moved back to Delray Beach, Florida. So she's one of my neighbors. She's a senior advisor for climate and health and for this international organization called Climate Care Without Harm. There she helps Florida healthcare systems build facility and community resilience on the topic of climate issues. She's also a steering committee member for Florida Clinicians for Climate Action, where she educates health professionals and the public about the health impacts that climate change is going to bring to us. And she advocates like Growing Climate Solutions for equitable solutions, because as you'll hear and learn, the issue of heat disproportionately impacts the most vulnerable among us. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn off my screen and turn it over to Dr. Katherine Toms. Hey everybody, it takes my computer a little bit to get going. And I guess you guys can see my screen now. Let's do the slideshow, that might be better. I have to go back a couple. I think this one takes a little bit of time to load. So I'm gonna stick, this is my second slide and I put it in here. If you all haven't seen it, I think it's really cool. So um, 
it, it is a little long, but it really gives you, I, I forward fasted it a little bit, I think, or no. It gives you an idea of how the world is heated up. The atmosphere is heated up since the beginning of the industrial revolution. And it's, I just think it really drives it home. And this is all based on data that NASA has collected. So extreme heat, why are we talking about that today? So um, it has negative impacts on not only our health, but also the economy. It raises the risk of heat related illnesses like heat stroke and heat exhaustion and extreme heats called the silent killer because it kills more people every year than all other weather related illnesses, um, uh, weather related events. So high temperatures are associated with air stagnation, which traps pollutants and can trigger respiratory illnesses like asthma. Yeah, isn't that cool? I really like that. Um, extreme heat stresses crops and food supplies and worsens drought. It raises the demand for air conditioning, which increases cooling costs uh, and strains our electric grill. And this makes staying safe and cool unaffordable for our residents living on the budgets. Oops, that's not what we want to do. Sorry, guys, technically challenged a little. Okay, so this graph shows uh, global temperatures compared to the 20th century average. Each year from on the right, you'll see the last year is 2021 down to the left, which is uh, 1976, which was the last year that was cooler than the average. So NASA scientists who conducted um, a separate but similar analysis also determined that 2021 was the sixth warmest year on record tied with 2018. 2019 and uh, 2020 tied for the hottest year on record since uh, record keeping began in the, I think, 1880s. Um, so the past five years have been the warmest uh, years in the last 140 years. So this is um, a graph from Climate Central. They have a lot of good uh, information and, and graphs. Um, so there are two reasons why I think it's really important that we talk about extreme heat. One is that we need to prepare and adapt for more extreme heat days over the next decades. So even if we make moderate emission cuts, we'll still see if you look on the far right, 43 more days above 95 degrees by the end of this century. And number two, as you can see from the graph, this is Miami. Um, we can drastically reduce the number of annual high heat days from 72 to 43 if we're willing to make changes to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions now. Um, and I think there's a lot of reason to do that because the health of our children literally depends on our willingness to change now. And we'll see an effect um, already. Uh, and th this is just a prediction. We could see a drop in uh, warm temperatures uh, even before that, if you look at 2075. So um, Florida made headlines for record heat on March, uh, in March 2020 for being the hottest March for Florida in 126 years. But the trend stretches back a lot longer. State temp temperature averages have been higher than normal for 57 out of the last 60 months. So as a result of this extreme heat, there have been growing increases in heat-related hospitalizations in Florida. And as this diagram shows us, heat-related, um, uh, in addition to the heat-related hospi hospitalizations that the diagram shows us, there have been an increase in heat-related deaths. So uh, clearly climate change is harming our health now. 
But the good news is that virtually all of these deaths and illnesses can be prevented. So it's really important that we're prepared for extreme heat by taking both individual and collective steps to be resilient. So, okay. So whose health is most at risk? Well, the answer is really everyone's. Can do I need to move my pictures there? Does that help? No, we're good. Okay. Um, but certain people are more vulnerable than others. So pregnant women and people with pre-existing conditions like heart, lung, kidney, people who are on dialysis or have diabetes, uh, people with sickle cell disease, um, they're more, more likely to suffer from heat-related illnesses. Um, sorry. Right. So also people who live alone, um, people on a fixed income, and uh, people with mental uh, disabilities often need other people to help them stay cool and stay hydrated. Um, low income communities and uh, communities of color are especially at risk because they often live in substandard housing and are in inner cities where the urban heat island effect puts them more at risk. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, let's see, those who work and play outdoors are also at increased risk of heat related illnesses. So, so what are they really? Well, here is a, just a quick sum Dehydration falls under that, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and the worst, which has a mortality rate of between one and 15%, even some studies have shown a uh, 63% uh, mortality rate is heat stroke. Um, okay. So what are the signs and symptoms of heat stroke? First and foremost, an elevated uh, body temperature. People who are suffering from heat stroke have a fast pulse. Um, they're hot, uh, their skin is hot, red, and dry, sometimes damp. They can often have nausea or vomiting, confusion, delirium, loss of consciousness, or seizures. So the signs and symptoms of heat exhaustion and heat cramp, uh, those are similar, dizziness, headache, confusion, um, fainting, fatigue, cold, pale, clammy skin, and muscle pain or muscle spasms. So really, this is one of the key takeaways that I want you all to have because just remembering this and having a couple of tools to help you will keep you from getting a heat-related illness. They'll keep you feeling energetic and, and um, not drag during the summer, which are really, uh, so our summers are pretty hot and humid. So stay cool, stay hydrated, and stay informed. Um, also, uh, I think Bridget's going to send out some more information. I, I can come back to this, but there's a wonderful um, uh, app that you can download that's from the Department of Labor that gives you a lot of great information and tips, and it can give you real-time information on um, the heat index, which is a combination of both heat and humidity, humidity which is very important in Florida because we the humidity uh, worsens um, the effect of high temperatures on our bodies. So, um, so how do we prevent uh, heat illnesses in the first place? We've seen a lot of this on TV, a tragic situation. So just don't ever leave your kids or your pets in the car. Although Teslas do have a pet um, setting that runs air conditioning in the car when it's off. Um, let's hope there'll be more and more cars like that, but I don't think it's a good idea to leave your pet or your child in the car when you're not in it anyhow. 
Um, so that's first and foremost. And then there's uh, just drink uh, water. There's an eight by eight rule, which is eight, eight ounce glasses of water a day, which is about a half a gallon. Um, if you're a diet, if you're on a diuretic or um, on a water or salt restricted diet or have high blood pressure, heart disease, or other chronic illnesses, you should probably talk to your doctor about how to adjust that uh, liquid intake um, because of your medication and your illness. Um, a good gauge is just to make sure you have pale yellow urine that it's not concentrated. Um, avoid caffeine, alcohol, and sugary drinks when it's hot outside because um, you lose extra fluid then. And stay out of, uh, out, stay inside and don't have any outdoor activity when the heat index is really high. You can exercise in the early morning or late afternoon. If you exercise outside, go for a walk early or late. Um, yeah. And always stay informed. You can follow the local news. You can download the OSHA app that Bridget's going to share with you later. Um, and, and the weather apps are great to just check before you go outside and make sure you're not exposing yourself to extreme temperatures. Um, you should look for shade or air AC um, when it's hot. And it really, the uh, data shows that just a couple of hours of air conditioning during the day on hot days, if you don't wanna run your air conditioning, you can go to a public place now that COVID is hopefully behind us and, um, and uh, like uh, malls or, or the public library, those are great places to stay cool. And wear a hat like colored clothing, like or, or loose fitting clothing when you're outside. And um, a really great uh, thing is take a cooler shower or bath at night, to cool down your body um, because nighttime temperatures are really great for staying cool the next day, just like it's important for our cities to cool down at night so that they're not susceptible to heat the next day. Um, see then first aid if someone you know seems to have the signs and symptoms that we just went over if you think it's heat stroke um call 911 right away and if heat exhaustion symptoms have have lasted more than an hour call 911 um, move the person to a cooler place inside if you can to air conditioning have them lie down um, wait for the EMT uh, before you give them water or any kind of drink if you think it could be heat stroke. Otherwise, they can um, sip on some water. It's really important that you already start cooling that person down. So ice packs, if you have them, or cool towels and apply them to where there's a lot of blood flow, either at the neck, the groin, the axilla, and you can spray, uh, spray them with, uh, if you have a water bottle, spray them with that. And you can put them near a fan if there's a fan outdoors, if you're not able to get to AC. Um, let's see. Uh, and if they do have symptoms of heat exhaustion, they can drink slowly. So, um, So heat also affects people with pre-existing conditions more than uh, other people. And so extreme heat increases pollution like ground level ozone and those little tiny particles called fine particulate matter, uh, 2.5 particulate matter. Um, and that worsens both heart disease and respiratory diseases like COPD and asthma. And um, remember about, um, let's see, extreme heat can cause cardiac stress and can aggravate previously diagnosed heart disease and even cause first 
chest pains or shortness of breath. Um, and the American Heart Association published a review recently um, that showed an increased risk of stroke during hot weather as well. Um, people with mental illness have triple the risk of death during heat waves. Um, so that's an important population if you have anybody in your family who um, suffers from any mental illness, uh, watch out for them because also their medications make them more at risk. Antidepressants can uh, make you more susceptible to heat. Um, and extreme heat causes, has been uh, shown in studies to increase violence, aggression, and suicide. And people with kidney disease are really susceptible. There are studies that uh, show among farm workers that exposure to extreme heat and, and heavy labor, as well as pesticides and uh, insect, um, um, fertilizers show uh, increased uh, incidence of kidney failure and kidney stones. So, yeah. so one thing that has worked in a lot of cities is something called the buddy system where, and there are some uh, departments of public health that have, have helped organize the buddy system that you can call friends, relatives, neighbors who are older and check on them a couple of times a day. Just uh, give them a call or stop by on high heat days. There's a buddy system that OSHA has uh, recommended for outdoor workers to check on each, other's, each other. And um, there are new laws for high school athletes because of accidents in the past that they um, have to, when the temperature is above 90 five degrees, I think, uh, heat index. They have to take water breaks in the shade. Um, right, let's see, whoops. Let me just go on to, do you guys have any questions? We're gonna just go to, if you don't, we'll just talk right away about the urban heat island effects and save the questions afterwards unless there's something pressing. Catherine, no. I think it might be easier just to save the questions after the presentation. Okay, sounds good. Um, I just wanted to check in, make sure you guys hear me well and everything. So um, the term urban heat islands, uh, you've probably heard that in the news. So let's just go over what it means. Um, it's when an urbanized area that, that experiences higher atmospheric and surface surface temperatures than the suburban areas uh, that surround it. And this is due to human activity. It's just us doing our normal daily activities, moving around in our cars. And um, uh, a lot of it is uh, due to radiation from buildings that absorb the heat from the sun. And so why are they important? Um, Urban, the urban heat island effect has been associated in multiple studies with adverse health impacts, increased energy consumption, increased greenhouse gas emissions, um, more water usage, and more expenditures for cities and for individuals because they have to run uh, more air conditioning to uh, combat the heat. Okay, so what are the contributing components to the urban heat islands? Um, like I mentioned just previously, it's man-made structures, the buildings themselves, but also the roofs absorb heat when they're hot. Asphalt roofs um, uh, absorb the most heat. Um, pay, our black pavement absorbs the sun's energy and radiates it back into uh, our world. Um, so also I mentioned that uh, just our daily activity, driving our cars and running our air conditioning and our lawn mowers generate a lot of heat. Um, and when there are especially fewer trees and just less vegetation in general, um, we, our cities lose their natural ability to cool down, especially at night. 
And public building, buildings make these uh, urban canyons that prevent natural normal wind flow, which uh, cools um, our cities. So um, as we mentioned, it, it has an inequitable impact on our residents, uh, impacting uh, low income and communities of color uh, the most with um, the things that I mentioned before, like energy consumption, more air conditioning use. Um, and uh, a recent study showed that air conditioning accounts for about 6% of all our electricity use in the US. That's about 117 million metric tons of carbon dioxide each year. And the main refrigerants that are used to um, run our air conditioners they include a class of chemicals called hydrofluorocarbons. And um, these are much more potent than carbon dioxide. They don't uh, stay in the atmosphere, most of them quite as long, but they're much more potent. And um, also urban heat islands increase air pollution. Um, and I don't have data for Naples, but greater Tampa, has consistently received an F rating from the American Lung Association State of the Air Report. Um, and also uh, people who live in urban heat islands have increased pulmonary and cardiovascular as well as kidney and heat related illnesses. Also poor water quality um, is a result of urban heat islands and our municipal uh, water treatment facilities um, have to use more energy. So it's a vicious cycle uh, with urban heat islands using more energy that makes our cities hotter. So there are things we can do to sort of even the playing field, things like trees and vegetation, green roofs, cool roofs, I'll go over that just uh, briefly. Uh, cool pavements and smart growth. So um, these are uh, all called passive techniques as opposed to air conditioning and cooling. Um, and uh, a lot of the um, mitigation strategies here that I've listed are things we can do collectively as a community. But uh, for yourself, a way to keep your house co uh, cooler so that your electric bill stays down and you don't use as much energy. You can put um, wall or uh, window coverings on the outside of your house, like shutters, or a lot of people have awnings, retractable awnings. There are all kinds of um, interesting different styles of awnings that match different kinds of types of houses. Um, and tile and drywall are really good at releasing heat. They stay cool um, and keep the temperatures um, about the same as the air around them, or, or they, they don't absorb temperatures like um, other materials. So those are good to use. And of course, um, plants, planting, especially on the south side of your house with um, native trees. And we'll talk, uh, I have a link where you can look up native trees in your area and so that you can plant the right trees um, because those are really important as far as using resources. They're resilient to, native trees are resilient to heat, drought and insects. They need less water and fertilizer. And back to cool roofs. Um, so you can either, when you replace your roof, get a, a more reflective material, a lighter color usually, but there are a lot of different products now that are actually darker roofs that are reflective too. Um, or paint. Paint is a very low cost way of cooling, cooling your home, reducing your energy burden. So um, I think that runs about two to $400 per house to paint your roof. Um, and on a hot sunny day, a reflective roof could stay more than 50 degrees cooler than a conventional roof. So conventional roofs can get up to 150 degrees um, 
on a hot, hot sunny day, the ones that absorb the most uh, energy. Um, and there are a couple of links. Um, Bridget has one, I have another one uh, that you can um, check out different options for cool roofs and learn more about that if you're interested in updating your house with a cool roof. Um, green roofs are also a cool way. They need more maintenance and um, where you just plant a certain kind of vegetation on your roof. They're really good for bigger buildings because they also absorb storm water runoff. Um, and if you have screens uh, in good condition, you can open your windows at night when the temperature drops and, that, um, and you can use cross ventilation to cool uh, in the inside of your home in the evening. Um, let's see, I think that's about, we can talk about other things if you wanna go into that a little bit later. So this is from my backyard and luckily this ginormous mango tree is not on our property. That is our neighbors uh, in the backside of our house, but we love this tree. And I think the most important thing when you talk about greening is don't cut down mature full growth trees. It takes years to get a big, um, ficus or banyan or mango tree growing an oak tree it, um, is terrific when it comes to absorbing um, pollutants in the air and reducing our greenhouse gas uh, emissions and cooling. So um, policies in our cities and, and counties that um, don't allow developers to cut down trees, those are really important. You can advocate for those. Um, uh, another good thing that I didn't mention is cooling centers. Uh, those are becoming more common also with uh, COVID. Sometimes their schools, sometimes their libraries or other um, public places that you can hang out. There are people that people are even starting interesting things like games and socializing in those and public spaces with lots of water fountains and pools. You can advocate for that or even volunteer to be on a committee to, for greening in your um, municipality. So, um, oh, another thing is really important. You may wanna, uh, if you really wanna get involved is advocate for heat emergency preparedness um, contingency plans. So that, for example, there's a good plan for people who have pre-existing conditions, particularly people on dialysis if there's a power outage and things like that, how those people can be notified and helped um, so that they are um, taken care of. And then my last slide, whoops, is just that everything you do really matters. And together we can accomplish um, seemingly uh, overwhelming tasks. So if we break them down into small doable changes that benefit our health and our community, we can have a cleaner, healthier world. So thank you very much. And thanks to Anna and Bridget for inviting me. I'm ready for any questions you may have. So here, um, shoot, sorry. Here are some good links. I'll make sure Bridget has these. I think I need to update a couple. Um, uh, this doesn't pertain to heat per se, some of these, but I really like, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, I really like this Future 50 Foods. If you guys would like to check that out, it's about using um, grains and different things that are not only healthier for you than uh, rice or wheat, but they also use less water and energy to produce. And um, there's a green market for South Florida. I'm not sure if that includes um, Naples. So I'll update this and make sure Bridget has it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Catherine. Um, if you close down your PowerPoint and we put everybody back on the screen, we can field questions. I think everyone's on mute. So if you wanna speak up, um, wave and we will acknowledge you hopefully. 
and you could put on your um, microphone and ask some questions. And we're all here to, to field some answers for you. Uh, anybody have something? Okay, Roz, you wanna unmute your mic? There you go. <clears throat> Thank you. Very, very interesting um, subject and information, uh, Dr. Toms. Um, I get a, I receive a, a magazine on a quarterly basis. It used to be called Neurology Now, but now they call it Brain and Life. And in that um, was recently that what affects Parkinson's disease and dementia, and I'm sure there are some others, is not just the foods we eat, but the air we breathe. And listening to you about all the different people who, their disabilities and stuff like that, it really made me um, think about uh, never mind what I eat because I try not to eat anything with nitrates and stuff like that, which I know are poisons for, for my body. But um, always to think of, and we kept it, we, and it's more of a subject than a question. We need to keep our air, air conditioning on all the time. My granddaughter has asthma and we are keeping it down. And like when she didn't go to school, she, she didn't have any asthma attacks. So we can't even open our windows during the nighttime because of all the problems that, that happens. Um, what do you do when you're stuck in the house <laughs> and you can't get out because of the sun? I'm allergic to sun and the heat, not to the degree of heat exhaustion or, or, or uh, stroke and stuff, heat, heat stroke, but I take a medication which I need and it does affect me and I didn't know it until I moved down to Florida full time. Um, there's no other way of getting around it that I can't do all the things that everybody else has to do. But um, I just wanted to say that I've, I've been with that extreme heat at, a, at an outside um, game and it is not fun to all of a sudden think you know, that you're gonna fall flat in your face. So listen to your body is my suggestion that you, um, you've you given us all that stuff to do. And um, I love what you had to say, thank you. You're welcome. Well, to your point, um, I think if you can acclimate to to the heat, it or it's it's not just thinking it the, it's a fact. If you can acclimate your body slowly to the heat, go out in shorter spurts, go out in the morning. Right now, or at least a couple of weeks ago, is it was relatively cool, and that's how you build up tolerance. And that's why there are certain recommendations with OSHA that new hires working in uh, like the agricultural business that they, they just work two hours the first day and then they slowly increase it over two weeks. You can follow those same, uh, that same pattern of slowly building your tolerance to heat, not that you just go out, but sometimes I think what happens is people are very unused to heat. Then they find themselves out in the heat suddenly in the middle of the day. And that's when they are really uh, susceptible to heat uh, stress. So um, if you know you're gonna be spending some time out like in the summer a little bit more, slowly get used to that. I think that's an important thing and just really make sure you're drinking plenty of water because dehydration really um, is uh, a contributing factor to sort of spiraling um, from heat. Thank you. Thank you. Cynthia, you have a question? Um, I, uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I've unmuted. Um, actually, a couple questions um, all related. Um, I'm in the process of working on a remodeling project for an HOA, and I would like to implement some green strategies in light of things that you've just said. Um, one, the two things came, uh, jumped out at me. One is you said, we have asphalt, which, and I think we should change to pavers. Um, and the other thing is you said that there are some vegetations that you can plant on, you know, we have a lot of low carport areas. Do you know of specific um, plants that are good for that? And, and do you know of any resources I can look at for studies that show the, um, the value of pavers over asphalt in connection with in um, topics like what you're talking about? Well, anything that's lighter generally will be better. There, um, currently the city of Los Angeles is um, doing a pilot. Uh, they've done one before, but a bigger pilot project 
with um, actually painting the asphalt in their area. I can try and find that or you'll probably be quicker Googling it. It's the, mm -hmm. the city of Los Angeles. Um, but uh, Bridget will share with you links to look up um, information about cool pavement. Uh, there's there's a, hang on just a second, maybe I even have it. Cynthia, I think I we can send you some of those things. Let me, okay. um, because I have mm -hmm. them in some of my PowerPoints as well. There are some sources on cool pavement. So we'll put that together for you and send it out. Um, and the paver, it. Mm -hmm. the, the paver issue isn't just heat, it's drainage. But right. I want to make sure that we can answer as many other questions on the health topic that we can. So any other speakers? Don, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tom. That was that was excellent. Uh, could could you tell us a little bit about the organizations you're affiliated with, the Healthcare Without Harm or Florida Clinicians for Climate Action? Yeah. I'm, I'm not familiar with them, but they sound important. Yeah, sure. I'll start with Healthcare Without Harm. It's an international organization that um, has been working with healthcare systems around the world, and it's been around for the past two decades. It's the founder of Healthcare Without Harm started by addressing mercury in hospitals and um, realized there's mercury in every single thermometer or there was. And he sort of led that effort across the world to ban the use of mercury in, in hospitals, basically. You know, all the thermometers we have no longer are the old fashioned kind that if you dropped it, you had to, you know, back away. So that has been really important and uh, has had a huge environmental impact, not only on us, but on wildlife and our environment. And then about, um, I guess about 12 years ago, uh, the focus became more directed towards uh, lowering greenhouse gas emissions in healthcare facilities. So Healthcare Without Harm has um, another uh, partner organization called Practice Green Health, and they work with uh, hospitals to uh, become more sustainable, both um, all the way through from the uh, construction process, which uh, we know that concrete and steel use a lot of greenhouse gases to picking the right materials, yeah, a lot of uh, lead gold and platinum um, uh, buildings. And then also procurement is really important when it comes to reducing hospital admissions, because in the U.S. they account for 4.5% uh, percent of all greenhouse gas emissions. So it doesn't make sense for us to be uh, contributing to the problem that makes people sick. So that is the whole premise with Healthcare Without Harm. And uh, there are a lot of different ways, reducing waste, just switching out LED lights to LED lights can reduce energy burden and costs, lots of different things from, from the products they use to um, you know, helping employees and patients get to hospitals using uh, cleaner transportation, setting up charging stations in hospitals, things like that. And quickly, Florida Clinicians for Climate Action was founded the end of 2018. It's a nonprofit uh, that is just a group of not only physicians, but clinicians who educate the public and other clinicians about the health impacts of climate change and um, advocate for clean energy solutions with um, you know, lawmakers, both locally and nationally. So uh, if you know anyone who is a clinician, we'd love to have them join. And there's lots of work to do. Um, I'm gonna take a moment to just share uh, my screen for a second. If everybody can see this graph from Noah, this is, do you see that uh, heat index chart, everyone? Yeah, nod. Yes. Um, just so that you know that we're not just blowing smoke here, literally. Um, this is the NOAA National Weather Heat Service. And people are like, well, how often is the heat index 
above a dangerous temperature for us in Florida. And, you know, does this really apply to us? Do we really have to care? And yes, we do, because the this is in the orange and red zone is the area where we start to see all of these really bad impacts of heat. And um, while it's not often, you know, we have pretty temperate weather, it's not often over 92, but our average humidity in Florida is 74% year round. This includes the dry season, that's the average. So during the summer, we easily exceed this. So if you follow the 75 across, it doesn't have to be really more than 90 or even 88 before the heat index is over 100. Um, and it's misleading. People quote the temperature, not the heat index all the time. So for you to you know, sense that it's really hot, you have to go to the heat index chart more than just, oh, it's a mild 88 or 85. It can be you know, 86, but if the heat index after the summer is 90 degrees, which we know it is because first it rains down and then it evaporates, it can impact you. So keep this, you know, you can look this heat index chart up on Google anytime, but keep in mind that it doesn't have to be 96 or 98. It can be a lot, the temperature can be a lot lower when the heat index is already quite high. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. Uh, do we have other questions for Dr. Toms? I have a question for you. Can you send out all those links by email? I'm on the tablet and I can't get to everything. <clears throat> um, yes, we will. We can, a, a couple of things. Her, uh, Dr. Tom's presentation will be on our website in a day or a couple of days. Give us some time to download it and upload it onto the website. So you can always get it off of that, but we will try to excerpt this and perhaps send out a follow-up email to all those that signed up with at least the, the links. Thank you. Any other questions? Put on your smiley faces. Is that, oh, there you are, Mary Lynn. What would you, let me unmute you or can you unmute yourselves and you wanna ask a question? Dixie, do you wanna? Oh, there you Hello go. from Vanderbilt Presbyterian Church. We are delighted to be your newest partners. <laughs> Great. Do you have a question for Dr. Tom? No, we can't see it. Oh, I can see it. We can hear you just fine. Any questions? If you move the that move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can get back to you. We have a question from Margaret. Margaret, can you, Margaret Blake, can you take your, uh, unmute yourself? There you go. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, really interesting and informative um, uh, discussion and your subject. Thank you, Dr. Toms. My question is, could you go over again a bit more about the differences between heat stroke and heat exhaustion? Um, I didn't get, or just expand on that a little bit, please. Well, let me pull that up. Hang on a second. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention, um, there is a primer for cool cities, reducing excessive urban heat. Now that, it's almost more for city officials, but there's a lot, I, back to the question about how, and you guys seem like a real um, uh, information hungry bunch. Uh, so there's a lot of information in that. And I'll, I'll, I, th I think Anna probably knows it and I'll make sure that that, that link gets out to everybody. It's called a primer for cool cities. You can probably Google it and find it too. So when it comes and back to um, heat related illnesses, let me try and pull the up question my... is what's the difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke? So basically you it's the more exaggerated of the two. So heat stroke the thing that really defines it is that core temperature goes up to 104 or more. So there's a, there's a point at which no human being can uh, take uh, a core temperature of more than, I think it's 100.7 degrees Fahrenheit. That's called the human thermal maximum. And so 
uh, heat stroke is just an extension of heat exhaustion. And the two things that are different are that temperature is higher, but often when you're outside, when that happens, you don't have a thermometer. And one thing you notice is um, hot, dry skin. That person is no longer able to compensate by uh, sweating. That uh, internal feedback mechanism fails. So their skin all of a sudden is dry. And they often are um, confused, delirious. Sometimes they even lose consciousness. I would say, before that happens, make sure that person who's kind of really sweating, really tired is drinking lots of water and get them in the shade or better in air conditioning. And really, if you have access to some cool water or an ice pack, if you can, if you're out, a cold drink, anything like that, if you put it, put it on that person's um, uh on their neck or on their wrist, that will help pull them down quickly. That's the main thing and call 911. Any other questions? Anybody, anybody waving here? I can't see, most people just have their names up. So if you're waving at me and your camera is off, I can't tell. On, a, a, that, that, on that heat index, is there a, a combined number that is lower than 107 because of humidity that that is where it's intolerable well um, that that is uh that's your internal temperature that i was talking about it's 90 95 degree heat index is i believe anna you may know this uh what um noah uses Yes, And um, that is in discussion right now, especially in South Florida. Miami-Dade County is doing a lot of work on heat. You, there is a link that you can go to for, that's through the Miami uh, Community Foundation that is uh, on uh, heat. And there's some tools there. There's a toolkit that you can look up if you go to that website a heat health toolkit. And there'll be more information on that. Um, yeah, so I would say right now, it's a heat index of 95. That's a combination of humidity and ambient temperature that uh, triggers the heat warning system for uh, NOAA. Anna, is that correct? Yeah, I, yes. I believe I'm right on that. Yeah. Well, it's the, the number that people are very concerned about is when the heat index is over 105, but it doesn't take much. I'm looking at the chart. I'm not putting it up to reach a heat index of 105. If the, if the humidity is at 70%, which is pretty common in Florida, the temperature outside only has to be 90 degrees. So you can have a 90 degree day. And we're not, you know, nobody shies away from a 90 degree day. But if the temperature, if the, if the humidity is 70% and you have 90 degrees, you've reached a heat index of 105. And that's what people often don't put together. It's like 90 in Florida, okay, that's a hot day, but it's not alarming. But it should be if the, if the humidity is over 70%, because 70% humidity, and a 90 degree day will give you a heat index of 105. So those thresholds are a little lower than you might anticipate because of the amount of humidity that we feel. And that climate central chart that Dr. Toms showed for Miami, in my presentations, I've often shown it for Fort Myers. And we are going to experience in the next 30 years, a tripling of the number of days in the year 2000, in Fort Myers, there were about 26 days when the heat index was over 105. By 2050, that's going to be 57 days. And by 2070, that could be 157 days a year. That's more than half the year where the heat index will be over 105 if we don't reduce the amount of greenhouse gases and temperatures continue to rise. So in this, you know, that number tells us two main things that I could you know, if I wrapped up Dr. Tom's presentation, the adaptation and the mitigation. On one hand, 
We know that these temperatures are gonna go up. Many of us are homeowners. It's really time to seriously think about the insulation that you have in your roof, the kind of tile next time you change your roof. And I have a personal story I can share with you on that. The kind of glass that you put in when you change your windows, you should go to e-glass. You know, yes, does it cost 10% more? It does. Will you save it in your energy bill? Of course. Um, the shades, this is not a decorator's issue. Don't let your decorator tell you, oh, shears are in. Yeah, shears are in, but sun is coming through your windows. If you are serious, you have to get blinds or put a shade over your windows. All of these things will help keep your home cooler, use less electricity, which saves you money and puts less of a burden on the grid. So all of these are adaptation techniques. Shade your patio, put up a lot of plants and trees on, on your patio. And then there's the mitigation. We really have to do something about the greenhouse gas emissions. As the chart that Dr. Toms showed, if we can reduce the greenhouse gases to prevent the heat or the global temperatures from rising above that two degree or 1.5 degrees Celsius marker, we're gonna do a lot better. And we're nowhere near close to getting to that target. And so every little bit helps. So on one hand, do the things to protect yourself. On the other hand, do the things that globally help protect all of us. So I guess that that would be um, a takeaway. Myra, you, you raised your hand for a moment. Uh, I'm just curious. It's, it's not so much a health issue, but I really appreciated the talk. Uh, but have you ever seen a, a study that compares the use of tile on floors and houses versus wood? Uh, because the tile really holds the coolness uh, well into the daytime, even when it gets very hot, which wood, wood warms up very quickly. And I'm just curious about air conditioning efficiency in an all tile house versus one that has wood floors. No, all the decorators are recommending wood now, and which you know is also not, uh, that's going in the opposite direction than what we need in terms of saving our trees. Um, but uh, I think that there is actually an energy dif difference as well. Yeah, you're right. I touched on that a little bit. Yes, tile it is, you're right, exactly what you said. And um, I have a friend who uh, has spent his whole life working on that and has sent me lots of information. I can share it with Anna and you all can, can have at it. It's uh, There's a lot of research on that and it's exactly what you said. Yes. Terrific, thank you. Okay, so if we're almost done, um, I will wrap it up and make a plug for two more presentations that are coming up. Um, one, and as I said earlier today, next week, Wednesday at four o'clock, we have the final climate compass with um, the sustainability director, the global sustainability director from Ford Motor Company. They'll be talking, she'll be talking about electrification of the automobile market in the US. Um, she usually doesn't do presentations. It took me quite a bit of cajoling to get her to agree. So please sign up on our website for that. And then final, the final um, why and how of this season will be May 4th. We're gonna do a piece on composting because when we're talking about mitigating greenhouse gas, we often think of it all as in carbon, 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 but there's also methane and organics break down into methane so composting is a really good way to reduce methane emissions and to reduce your personal carbon footprint, but it's a lost art. Many of us don't know how to compost because public sanitation has just made garbage go away, um, but we should all learn about it. So sign up for the last May 4th uh, why and how, and we will follow this up with a survey when you get the survey, uh, the top five recommendations from Dr. Toms will be on the landing page. So sort of some takeaways, and we will try to circulate some of those links as requested to this mailing list. So with that, um, please join Growing Climate Solutions, follow us on social media, make some comments, share what we post to others. That gets the word out and gets more people interested. And um, with that, I hope that we covered all the questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Toms, for spending your morning with us. And um, we hope that if you're a physician on the phone, 
are on this call or you know one, maybe they want to join Florida Clinicians for Climate Action. I'm sure they would be interested in more members because doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners are among our trusted speakers. Our public really values the words of their doctors and physicians. So they're excellent spokespeople for the climate issue. So if you know somebody who wants to engage, this might be an opportunity for them. Thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you.